I would say that, or mention the fact that spring has sprung, but if I say that tomorrow, it'll snow. So I'll just be quiet. <laughs> I think I've done that two or three times. But, um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because we don't live too far from the Tasuki Creek and it's been awesome to see it running or flowing pretty, pretty good. It's been really nice. Uh, probably in another two or three weeks, we'll be able to hear it from my house, which is really nice. Hey, Alita, can you get that door, please? Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. For everybody's doing well, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number 14. Um, my hope and prayer is that we can um, get through the entire chapter tonight. It is a loaded chapter, as you will see here in a minute. So um, we're just going to kind of play it by ear and let the Spirit of God lead like only He can. And uh, we'll get through whatever he leads us through this evening. Um, you know, typically this could be a three-week series, but as I was looking at some of my notes, I think we started the book of Revelation almost exactly a year ago. So um, that could be a new record for a study, but I, I don't know. But um, everybody doing well? Period. It's good to see you, bro. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to dive right into the, uh, the book of Revelation. Father, we come before you, Lord, this evening, just grateful. Lord, just thankful for you, for your goodness, Lord, your love towards us. And uh, Lord, I just pray that as we consider <clears throat> what your word says about um, the future, Lord, I also pray and ask that you would reveal to us some practical things, some principles that we could uh, consider and that we should apply in our lives, Lord, so that we could um, live lives that truly, genuinely glorify you. And uh, Lord, I just pray that your spirit would have your way in each and every heart tonight, that you would just reveal to us from your word uh, the significance of this chapter and where it sits and um, just the divineness by how you've, you've placed every one of these pieces of text exactly where you place them, Lord God, to to shed light, to reveal, to provide truth. And Lord, we ask that your spirit will lead us into all truth tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Um, amen, amen. <clears throat> is Tim Sanchez around? Where is he? There he's hiding. Hey, Tim, can you cool the room down a little bit? Is it warm in here or is it just me? It's just me. It's warm. Yeah, thank you. Um. Yeah, every time I mess with those thermostats, I end up uh, turning the furnace on or the, the heaters. But uh, So go ahead and take your Bibles. Turn with me to this 14th chapter. Uh, we're going to be considering and, and hopefully getting through 20 verses tonight. Um, just glean and unpack some really um, profound and significant truths. And I'm going to share with you some thoughts of how and where it sits in the overall book um, as we uh, continue on in our study. Um, as you all know, and I think um, we shared this with you a couple of times. Jay, if you want to go ahead and bring up, or Larry, the book of Revelation chart, please. I uh, just want to kind of give you some perspective in terms of where we're at. Uh, because one of the things that <clears throat> we've, um, we've imparted to you over the last several weeks when we began this study, especially as you get to chapters 6 through 19, which, is, which are the chapters that focus on what we know as the tribulation period. The tribulation period, remember, divided into two parts, three and a half um, in the first part, and then the great tribulation, as Jesus referred to it in Matthew 24, verse number um, uh, 16, I believe it is. He referred to it as the great tribulation. And uh, he also makes mention of the fact that it's a period and a time that this world has never seen. Or witness. So I just want to remind you and echo because this is really where we find ourselves in <clears throat> this part of our study, in this part of the book, and especially as we look at where it sits here in the 14th chapter. Um, but uh, I, I shared with you as we were beginning and going through this book that every once in a while the Spirit of God has taken what we call a pause or a parenthetical passage because he wants to reveal some things to us about uh, certain characters or, or personages or um, groups of people that are going to play a significant role. Because as you, all very, as you all know very well from our 
previous study, when we were in Matthew chapter 24, we were talking about the signs of the times and that kind of prepped us or prepared us for the book of Revelation, the words of Jesus in that 24th chapter, which we know as the Olivet Discourse, leading to the book of Revelation, uh, which focuses more on the actual events, the things that are gonna happen that are gonna play out um, that I want us to consider. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time like I normally do giving you a quick overview of the overall book of Revelation structure. I pray that by this time, and I'm looking at a lot of familiar faces, you know exactly how this book is structured, right? It's in three tenses, divided into three parts based on two significant events. The rapture of the church, Revelation 4.1, and the second coming of Christ, Revelation 19, verse 11. Two places where um, you see heaven opening. The only two places in the entire book where it opens. And it divides this amazing book into those three parts. So if you look closely at this portion right here, which is the second three and a half years, right? Um, as you can very well see, we're at chapter number eight, which is where the seven trumpets open up and then they kick in right here. And if you look down at chapter number 11 and you get down to 12 to 15 and they're kind of non-existent in that chart. Remember why that is? As a matter of fact, another chapter that's not up on the screen is chapter number seven. And uh, everybody can remind me as to why, right? Everybody remember why those chapters are not laid out? Because we're looking at events. We're actually looking at prophetic events that are gonna, that are gonna happen. Well, chapter seven and then chapters um, 11 through 14, actually 15, um, the focus is some key thoughts that the Spirit of God wants to reveal to us about certain characters that are gonna play out. So chapters, uh, if you remember from some previous studies, chapters 11, 12, and 13, which is where we camped out just before we took that little break. Um, I, why did we take breaks? I think we did the, uh, we did the, the, uh, the video, the documentary, before the wrath, and that's gonna, that's gonna play out a little bit tonight, as you will see in uh, one of the key events or one of the things that we're gonna consider, um, as well as um, I think Pastor Mike taught um, last week, because it was the first. So it's been, has it been three weeks since we've been together? I, th I think so, huh? And what happened, did I, was I sick? Yeah, uh, probably. It's been like, I think I've been sick a lot this, this year. But anyway, that being said, um, just a quick, quick overview of those three chapters, chapters 11, 12, and 13, where we find these um, seven characters or seven personages, I think is the term that I used. So there's this interval, this pause, where God is revealing who these, um, who these characters are. In chapter number 11, you find the two, they're known as the two what? Witnesses. The two witnesses. And who could remind me who those witnesses are? Moses and Elijah. Good job, you guys. It's pretty evident from the text, verses one through five, who they are, right? Because it mentions about drought happening and the other one about plagues. And uh, those are the two key characters. Again, and don't lose sight of the fact that both Moses and Elijah represent the Old Testament to us, right? Because this is, uh, this is a very Jewish-centric portion of the book of Revelation. Uh, these um, these chapters at the heart of the book, chapters six through 19, where God is dealing specifically with the nation of Israel. Now, I also mentioned, I think, and I shared with you how uh, Moses and Elijah show up in Matthew 17. Remember where Jesus uh, uh, meets with Peter, James, and John, takes them up to Mount Hermon, to the Mount of Transfiguration. He transforms himself or is transfigured and reveals to him how he's going to look at the second coming of Christ in all his glory. And who happens to show up? Moses and Elijah. So chapter number 11, again, the focus is those two, those two characters. And then in um, chapter number 12, we looked at three other characters, right? Or three other personages. One was the woman, the other, the dragon, and the third, the, um, the man-child. The woman is who? Our Lady of Guadalupe? Right? Our, it's Israel. It's the nation of Israel. And we see her going into the wilderness in that passage. And the dragon, the devil himself, Satan, persecuting her 
throughout the book of Revelation. So that is a really cool and lightning thing. And then we find mention of uh, that woman giving birth to the Messiah, and he's mentioned also in the middle part of chapter number 12. So that's five. And then there's two more characters in chapter number 13. Who are those two characters? Who can remind me? The two characters that show up in chapter number 13. The Antichrist and who else? And the false prophet. Good job, you guys. So there they are, all seven. So that's chapters 11, 12, and 13. So now we're diving right into chapter number 14. As you can tell from looking at the chart, it's not displayed up there because again, it's still part of this pause that God is doing. But here's what I would kind of, to give you a little bit of an analogy or an illustration, um, as, you start, as we start looking at the text and unpacking some of the verses that are, that are revealed to us, um, what God is doing in this 14th chapter is he's giving us like a, like a movie trailer, if you will, right? You're getting kind of a, a precursor to the rest of the book, to the rest of the book of Revelation from chapters uh, 15 to 19, which is where the main part of the book of Revelation is. So keep that in mind as we start looking at these passages, at these verses, because you're gonna see a certain group of people mentioned for a second time in the passage. And we're gonna look at some verses that um, really define and explain to us who um, who these folks are and what they represent as we look at some of the, uh, the words and phrases that are also mentioned in the text. So that's where we're at. We find ourselves right kind of in here, right? Between chapters 12, 13, 14, 15. We're gonna look at 15 because 15 is, again, also a precursor to the, what we're calling the seven vials. I think a lot of the newer translation used the term bowls, but that's really where things get intense. This, those seven vials are really a direct reference to what we would refer to as the wrath of God, where things get really intense on planet Earth. Um, but tonight you'll get a glimpse. Tonight you'll get um, a, a little trailer, if you will, a little precursor of how some of those events are going to play out. So... This is what our outline looks like tonight. We're going to be looking at these messengers and who they are and how they're redeemed in the first five verses of the chapter. Then we're going to look at the messages that are communicated, um, how they're going to be revealed to us. And then the last thing we'll consider tonight is um, a reference to the actual return of the Messiah. Again, these are like, look at it as a movie trailer, right? Anymore, you go to the movies and they spend, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes just giving you previews of upcoming movies. And by the time the movie starts, your popcorn is gone and you're ready to, yeah, I was, never mind. So, all right. So go ahead and turn with me to that 14th chapter. We're going to start looking at some of these verses right off the bat. If you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read the entire chapter. Um, again, keep in mind that outline as we go through it. I think, I don't think it's in your notes, but... Um, the, the main points are in your notes. But let's look first at how um, these messengers and see if um, this rings a bell from a previous study. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop you, stop our, our reading of the text and ask who and or where actually these, um, these folks showed up. Look at verse one. Then I looked, this is immediately after chapter number 13, obviously after the Antichrist and the mark of the beast is revealed. And now we see these words. Then I looked, it says, this is John speaking, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. Again, if you were to go to Israel today, there's two very unique geographical places on the map that the Jews often refer to as Mount Zion. One of them is the Temple Mount, and then there's this other location just west of the city of David that they also refer to as Mount Zion. And depending on whether you're really a devout Orthodox Jew, you're gonna look at the Temple Mount as being Mount Zion. And if you're more of a, a, uh, a Zionist, if you will, or someone who's there based on the theology of the land, they're gonna focus on the one that's out near the city of David. But as you will see as we read the verses, we're gonna consider the real Mount Zion. Anybody have any clues where that might be? In Jerusalem? Heaven. That's the real Mount Zion. And again, if you remember from our study way back in 
Revelation chapter three, or chapter four, verse one. Remember when we did that little study where I saw heaven opened? Remember that? And I think we looked and we shared with you some, some astronomical things that are out there, right? Man, one of the things that we're blessed to experience living where we live, and I would encourage you to do this, but if you go out at night, and you, if you look kind of, kind of almost to the northeast a little bit, and if you could find the Big Dipper, and right now the Big Dipper is going to be kind of upside down, the two end stars of the Big Dipper will point to what is known as the Pole Star or the North Star, True North. It's the last star on the Little Dipper, by the way, on the handle of the Little Dipper. That is true north. And if you consider what the Bible says about Mount Zion and the actual structure, did you know what the, that the universe has? And we talk about, and you talk about as astronomers always make reference to the uh, expanding universe. No, the universe has a, a structure to it. This is why when you see that battle playing out both in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 between the Lord and, and Lucifer where he's trying to take the throne of God, he says, I am going to take Mount Zion at the sides of the north, right? So it's really fascinating. So what does that imply? That there's some structure. How do we know that? Look at how... And again, I don't know what you believe or what you think about the pyramids or everything else, but look at the, the most stable structure, right? Engineering-wise is a triangle. And there's a reason why you see all these really bizarre, um, again, I, I believe structures that were built by the fallen ones, if you will, the sons of God, to remind us or to reveal, unbeknownst to some of us, the actual structure of the universe and there's a reason why the Great Pyramid of, of, of Giza right now today doesn't even have a capstone on it. It's been removed. It's not there. And uh, just fascinating if you consider how God and all these revelations and all these things that are mindful in terms of where it, where, what it is that we're considering when we look at these, these passages. So look with me again. This is John speaking. Then I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb stood the lamb, and who's with him? The 144,000. Do you remember these guys? What chapter? It was another one of those parenthetical chapters. Exactly, that's right, Arlene. Chapter number seven, we see mention for the first time of these, what we refer to, remember that the title of that study? The real what? The real Jehovah's Witnesses, we called them, or we referred to them as, Right? because that's exactly what they're gonna do. These guys are gonna show up in the tribulation period, in the great tribulation period, from 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, mentioned specifically by name in Revelation chapter number seven, and you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna be preaching the gospel to the entire world, to the entire planet. And if you remember, I did a follow-up sermon after we did that, the real Jehovah Witnesses study, and we referred to it the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. There's gonna be a worldwide revival. That's gonna cause the conflict and the adversary and the devil to get really intense in his attacks of what's going on with the 144,000 and the level and the amount of persecution that's gonna exist and um, how God is going to use them. At this stage of the game, at this stage of the tri Great Tribulation period, they have been literally, are you ready for this? They've been literally been martyred. So this is why they find themselves where? In heaven. And they're with the, with the Lord. Look at this. Then I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with them 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Remember that? That passage back in chapter number seven? And you're gonna see here and you're gonna know why it's in heaven. Look at this. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song, isn't that cool? And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. Who's singing this new song? Who do you suppose? Yeah, the 144,000. They're in the presence of God. They're in the presence of his throne. That's how we know it's heaven. Who's also present? 
while the throne is present, that means the king is sitting on the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. And who's surrounding the throne? The four cherub, the four cherubim. Remember Revelation chapter number four? The four faces, one had the face of a what? Of a lion, one had the face of an ox, a man, and an eagle. So this is where these guys find themselves at this point in in the book of Revelation, look at this. No one could learn from that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the what? Isn't that interesting? In other words, God rescued them. He saved them. Um, they were, I would venture to say, murdered, killed, but God brought them home to heaven. Look at verse number four. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women. What's the implication here that they're what? Ah, oh, interesting. I heard a, the V word, right? Virgin, right? Remember the documentary? A reference to the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25. Do you remember that passage? Some had the oil in their lamps, and their wicks pucked up and the other five did not, right? Now, who are these folks, right? See, because they're not the bride, right? You're gonna see here in a minute when we go to Matthew chapter 25, they're gonna be called the wise and foolish, not virgin, but virgins. Because who's the virgin? No. <laughs> yeah, she is the virgin, but who is the virgin prophetically? The Virgin Mary. The church. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter number Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. What? You've never heard that? Oh my goodness. Where what Bible have you been reading? Let me show you in the Bible where that's mentioned. Look with me in verse number Did I say 1 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 10. I want you to see this. Look what Paul refers to the body of Christ to the church in this passage. <clears throat> Second Corinthians, did I say 10? 10. 11. <laughs> I promise we'll get it right before the night's over. <clears throat> look, at, look closely and listen closely to the words in what Paul refers to the body of Christ to the church. He says this, would to God that you could hear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, right? Who's the husband? Remember our documentary? The Lord Jesus Christ. He has espoused you. In other words, you have been um, betrothed. Did I say that right? Betrothed? Betrothed. Say it again. Betrothed, yeah, that, that word. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste what? Virgin. Isn't that awesome? A chaste virgin, singular, unto Christ. So who's the chaste virgin? The body of Christ. She's a single entity in God's eyes. However, as we will see here in a minute in Matthew 25, we're gonna be introduced to the wise and foolish virgins that show up in the tribulation period, right? Look at, keep reading with me. But I fear lest any man, uh, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. And how is that corruption or how does that happen? Look at verse four. This is a fascinating verse. For, for if he that cometh preacheth, uh, uh, preacheth what? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that so prevalent today? All these different twisted notions about who Jesus is and who we, or who he isn't in their minds. That's the big issue. That's always the big issue is Jesus asking the disciples in Matthew 16, who do men say that I am? And then who do you say that I am, right? That's always the issue. Look at this. Preaching another, Jesus whom, ye have, whom we have not preached, or if ye have received another spirit which ye have not received, and man, did not Pastor Mike nail that on Thursday night? Right? There is another spirit out there. Deceiving and lying <clears throat> and giving you the impression, giving me the impression that it is of Christ. I'm telling you, man, just because it's spiritual doesn't mean it's biblical. 
Is it biblical? He drove that issue home as he was driving home this whole idea of faith, faith, faith. And what is the source of our faith? Can, can anybody here quote Romans 10, 17? <clears throat> faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Know the word of God. This is gonna be the key in you and I being able to discern all these other Jesuses, all these other spirits that are out there. You know what else is out there? Look at this. This other spirit which you have not received or another what? Ah, another gospel which ye have not accepted that ye might well bear with him. So he refers to the church, to the body Christ as a virgin, right? And look down at verse number 11. This is another interesting passage. Jump all the way down because 2 Corinthians 11 is fascinating to me because it really reveals how it is that the devil works. Look at verse number 11. And he says this, and no marvel, Watch this. No, look at verse 13. I'm sorry, back up one verse there. Uh, For such are false prophets. They're deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. You are deceived if you think he's gonna be this Baphomet that you see in some of these city halls around the country. No, man. He's going to come in disguised and he's going to be slick willy and everybody's going to think that he's Jesus. And your ability and my ability to discern whether or not it's the biblical Christ is being biblical in your perspective and your approach to discerning anything and everything that's going on in this world. Because man, the deception abounds like never before. Look at this. Therefore, he says, it is no great thing if the ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. That's exactly who he was talking about last Tuesday, right? And it's, and what are some of those other gospels that are out there? He touched on one significant one. The what? The 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 prosperity gospel, exactly, right? That only if you're blessed, only if you're healthy, wealthy, and wise are you, are you even close to God. What a lie that is, right? We know and we know from studying and knowing God's word, man, that to live godly in Christ Jesus that we're gonna what? We're gonna suffer. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to suffer today, man. And I was just blown away. I know I've seen some of their houses. Remember that other dude way a few years ago who had an air-conditioned doghouse for his dog even? It's crazy that um, the one guy from um, Louisiana, what was his name, Mike? Um, No, the other guy. Starts with a K. He, he, Cope, no, that's a C. Kenneth Copeland, his first name starts with a K. Kenneth Copeland, two Jets. Two Lear Jets. And you know what his motive for that is? He does not want to be around demon-possessed people riding coach in commercial airlines. Saw this, this, um, this uh, reporter interviewing him one time as to why. And he got a good deal, by the way. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, it's crazy. There's another new false gospel that is very prevalent today, which is on the other extreme, which is embraced by a lot of our Calvinist brethren. Does anybody know what that's referred to? The social gospel. The social gospel, right? It is so in our face like never before, right? And what is the devil, or what does the devil use in a significant way to keep us divided or to divide the body of Christ? race, right? So the social gospel is propagating or perpetuating this whole idea of keeping us divided. If you know Christ as your personal savior, I don't care if you're red, white, brown, black, whatever, you are my brother and you are my sister in Christ. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. That is the cool thing about what God does with the virgin, with the body, all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? What does that mean? That we're going to impart the gospel. What is the gospel in the church age, 
right? The good, that is the good news. That's what it means. But what is the explicit? The death, burial, and resurrection. That is the message. 1 Corinthians 15, it's really that simple. I don't know if I did it justice. I mean, I pray, man, I can't tell you how much I was on my knees on Easter Sunday just hoping and praying to give people the gospel. That he died on that cross for their sins, for my sins, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures for what? For our eternal life. That's why 1 Corinthians 15 is a really incredible, powerful chapter, not only defining the gospel, but speaks of the resurrection like no other chapter. Not just the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he resurrected, we too are resurrected. This is why you find the rapture explicitly mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 to 58, where he has brought death to, he's brought death to death. Victory, you're victorious in Christ. We as believers should never ever fear death because of who we are in Jesus. That being said, we should be fearless and courageous regardless of what's going on in this crazy clown show of a culture that we live in. So <clears throat> I don't even know where I'm at. We're back in the book of Revelation. So I just wanted to share with you some thoughts out of 2 Corinthians 11, the fact that um, the church is, yeah, I know why we went there, to explicitly show you in God's word how the body of Christ is refers, referred to as a virgin. And, and, and Paul's desire, Paul's hope, is that he present her a chaste virgin. Anybody know how she's going to become chaste? Because as I look at the body of Christ today, she's a bit of a mess, isn't she? She's pretty dirty, if you ask me. I mean, yeah, dirty in a bad way. Pretty sinful, latency and lukewarm, right? But what is the key, one key element? Larry, could you bring up the Revelation chart again? What is the one key thing, the one key event that's gonna happen that's gonna make all these wrongs right? The rapture of the church. No, not enduring to the end. That's for Israel, right? There's an event that's going to happen where things are gonna be purified. Say, you nailed it. The judgment seat of Christ. After that judgment, man, right? 1 Corinthians 3. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3. I want you guys to see this. Just, we need to connect these dots because you need to know where we fit into God's prophetic plan as it relates to the book of Revelation. We can't confuse ourselves and we can't think we're Israel, that Israel's the church and the church is Israel because you can pick up a commentary right now and there's, I, I was just looking at Tim LaHaye's book today on the book of Revelation. Just to, I like to get different perspectives of people. And LaHaye's done a really good job laying out some things um, prophetically. He's a believer in, in pre, a preacher of rapture just like you and me. But one of the things that he believes or that he teaches is that the 144,000 in the book of Revelation chapter number 14 are Christians. To me, Christian is church, body of Christ. No, the 144,000 are the 144,000. They're Jews reaching a world, the Jewish gospel. Al, do you have a question? Yes. Revelation refers to not being defiled. That's right. They're all men. Yes, they are. Yes. Hang on to that, because that phrase that you just quoted, that you just mentioned, is what drove us to this whole idea of the virgins. Not virgin, virgins. Where do we find the virgins? In Matthew 25, the 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish, and they were mentioned in the documentary. They did a great job, man, by the way. I, I don't know if it was um, J.D. Farag or if it was Jack Hibbs that would start, started talking about um, the oil and the wicks. I think it was Hib, wasn't it? If I remember right, yeah. So what did I tell you to turn? Look at 1 Corinthians 3. Really important chapter to consider. Um, a fascinating chapter is, is those of you that have been going through discipleship or um, are going through discipleship. When you get to lesson number 16, which is the very last lesson, we drive home the significance of this very key event in your and my life, the judgment seat of Christ. 
the judgment seat of Christ. This is where you and I will stand before the Lord and we will give an account for what we did with our lives after he saved us. This is why I'm, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I'm gonna say it again and again and again. There's more to this life than this life. What you do in this life is going to be manifest, as you'll see in the text, in this judgment where you give an account, not for your salvation, has nothing to do with your soul. That was handled on the cross for your works. And I'll take you to another place here in a minute. Look at verse number one. It says this, and I brethren, Paul says, and I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He's talking to a very immature church. The Corinthian church had all kinds of weird beliefs and notions about Jesus, about ecclesi- ecclesiology or the, how the church is to function and work. Look at verse two. He says, I have fed you with milk and not meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are not carnal, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, and ye are not carnal and walk as men, Right? What's the implication here? I heard a Calvinist guy the other day. Paul Washer is the guy's name. Everybody hear Paul Washer? He's a good preacher. You know what I dig about Washer? He really preaches hard and on, on sin and the convicting of sin, but you know what? His theology's bad. You know what he said in, his, in, in one of his sermons that I was listening to the other day? That there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Wow. Yeah, the church is full of carnal Christians, unfortunately. They are. Paul's mentioning them right here. Not only that, this whole battle that is playing out, right? We know from Galatians chapter number five, this battle between the spirit and the flesh. You're either gonna walk after the flesh or you're gonna walk after the spirit. That's our biggest challenge, our biggest issue. This is why he's driving these truths home in the context of the judgment seat of Christ. Look at this. He says, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another saith, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who was his Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? He says, I have planted, and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You know what was going on in, in Corinth? They were arguing about who baptized who, who, was, who they were connected to. You know what I, you know, I think I shared this thought the other day. You know what evangelism is? One beggar leading another beggar to bread. <laughs> We're all sinners in need of a savior. However, I will say this, God's desire, God's plan, God's purpose is that we be renewed, that ye be transformed, right? How? By the renewing of your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus Be biblical in your thinking. And this is how and where the transformation happens because when he, when your thoughts are biblical, when your thoughts are spiritual and sound, it's gonna affect who you are emotionally. And then the choices that you begin to make in this life are now right choices. Look at the rest of the passage. Verse seven. So then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God hath given the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive, are you ready for this? His own reward according to his own labor. There's your context. Has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with, who said works a minute ago? You did. You're spot on, Roberta. Look at the next verse. For we labor, for we are laborers together with God, Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. What's God's desire? What's, what, he, what does he want us to embrace? In it? That you are the temple of God, right? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. What, know ye not that you are the temple of God? You are not of your own. You're his, you were bought with a price, the word of God says. Look at the next verse. He says, for we, ha- we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. What's husbandry, by the way? It's a farmer, huh? What a, what a cool analogy. Now we're in the book of Ruth. We're gonna talk about 
the harvest today, that the whole second coming is all about God harvesting with a sickle. Look at the next verse, verse number 10. And according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereupon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. I love that that verse because Paul drives home the fact that God puts people in our lives, some people to plant, some people to water. At the end of the day, everybody's got a role and a purpose in each other's lives. My wife and I, after last Wednesday night, we we rarely drive in together, but we that night we drove in together and. This is not a pedestal thing, Mike, but she shared with me, she says, man, we are so blessed in how he teaches, right? Very different styles, I get it, but my goodness, man, what I am able to glean, what am I able to learn sitting under his teaching is a blessing. And we ought not take those people in our lives for granted because God orchestrates those. God puts us together together and you know, and, and, and we'll tell you, and we'll be really honest with you as a church, whenever we're trying to link people up discipleship-wise, we are very, very um, prayerful in terms of who and how God puts folks together. Look at the next verse. What verse am I on? Verse 11. <clears throat> For other foundation can no man lay that that is laid, which is in Jesus Christ. He has to be our foundation. Anything and everything that we do has to be him and about him. Now look at verse 12, key verses. Now if any man build upon this foundation, what foundation? Gold, silver, precious stones. Three things. Versus three other things, wood, hay, and stubble. Interesting, huh? You know, the first three things are really profound. What does gold represent in the word of God? Deity, Deity that's right who Christ is. What about silver? <laughs> That's from lesson 16. Are you guys on lesson 16 right now? That's pretty cool. No, I, I, I'm, I'm reading my Bible. Okay, good. <laughs> Let, so silver represents a gem, right? Jesus was given up for what? 30 pieces of silver. And what about precious stones? It's the souls of men and women. So here's, here's the point, just to kind of summarize those three things. Gold, so anything and everything that we do, that we labor, that we focus on has to be about him. Second thing, it needs to be about what he did for us. That's what motivates us. And then the third thing is at the end of the day, it has to be about the souls of men and women. Precious stones. How do we know precious stones is people? What did Peter refer to us as? Lively what? Lively stones. Remember um, remember one of the major, one of the most significant events in uh, Joshua chapter number three, as soon as as the Israelites crossed the Jordan, what did God have them do? Put up a pile of stones. Did everybody ever see the movie, uh, The Schindler's List? And how the movie ends? Ask Oscar Schindler's grave, who happens to be buried just, just to the north of the Mount of Olives. A Nazi, mind you, buried in Jerusalem, just north of the Mount of Olives. And we know all these Jews that he saved, right? Schindler's List. You should see, watch the movie. Anyway, they're known as Schindler's Jews. And the movie ends with them putting a stone on his gravestone. Go to any Jewish cemetery and you'll see stones on gravestones as a remembrance. What what an amazing thing that God has done in putting certain people together throughout his purpose and plan in this journey. Isn't that cool how he works? And then there's the wood, the hay, and the stubble. What's wood? It's dead what? Dead trees. Steve ought to know what that is because he's charging us for four cords of wood. 
What's, what's hay? Dead what? Dead grass. What about stubble? It's that stuff that these young guys have when they don't shave. <laughs> right? All these dead things. So man, it's either about who he is and what he did for you and people or about things that really don't matter in life. Look at the rest of the verse. Verse number 13, every man's work, not soul, but work. Every man's work shall be made what? Manifest for the day shall declare. What day is that, I wonder? The judgment seat of Christ. For the day shall declare because it shall be revealed by fire. Is that hellfire? Because we're going to talk about hellfire tonight. What, what fire is he talking about? Is there going to be a fire in heaven? Remember Revelation chapter 1? He's going to look you in the eye, man. Talk about conviction. The very God that saved me. What did I do with this one life that he blessed me with, that he redeemed me? Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what, what? Larry, back up. I want to focus on this last phrase. Every man's work of what sort it is. In other words, Paul is asking the question, why do you do what you do? What is your motive? It has to be about gold, silver, and precious stones. Verse number 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? What a reminder, huh? You're his, man. You're his temple. Ask yourself with some of the things that you allow these gates to witness or to experience if it's God honoring or not. So, the 144,000. Also in verse number three, going all the way back to Revelation chapter number, that was a huge rabbit trail, but it's all good, right? Um, I think it's an important one so that we understand. Could I share with you one other passage real quick? Um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number five. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5. Um, there's only two places where you find the phrase, the judgment seat of Christ, this being one of them. Look here in verse number, um, um, verse number seven, for we walk by faith, Paul says, and not by sight. Isn't that awesome? You are spiritual beings, in other words. Quit living in the flesh. Quit allowing your circumstances to dictate and determine and define you is really what he's driving home. Verse eight, for we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So this speaks of your spiritual resurrection. The day that you die, if you're not raptured out of here, you will die, right? Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed Unto man wants to die, and then the what? The judgment. Either lost or saved. Larry, put up the dispensational chart real quick. Check this out, you guys. The dispensation one. If you're saved, if you're saved, that's Revelation, the other one, the other chart. I think it's at the end. Check this out. Rapture. Judgment seat of Christ up here. Save people. Rapture of the saved. Rapture happens. You'll stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ to get your clean, whited garments, to become a part of the chaste virgin. And if you're lost, 
You'll either go through here, you'll end up here. And then we know this as the what? We're gonna look at it when we get to Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. It's known as the great white throne judgment or the judgment of the lost. Throw up the Revelation chart, Larry. The other chart. I don't think I have it on here, but I should put it on here. But at the end of the thousand years, there it is, the great white throne judgment. Judgment of the saved, judgment of the lost. There's only two types of people on the planet. You can count all the races and all the genders and all the other nonsense that we deal with in this journey and in this life today. But at the end of the day, you're either lost or you're saved. You either know Jesus Christ as your personal savior and if you do, you're gonna be raptured and you're gonna stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ so that he could prepare you for the marriage supper of the lamb. This is where you get those whited garments or not you personally, but we corporately. You've been cleansed. That fire has been, has judged your works through his eyes. It's awesome how God works or you will stand before him here. And we'll get to that when we get to Revelation chapter number 20. The judgment of the lost. A.K.A. the great white throne judgment. Um, 2 Corinthians 5. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, Paul says, and willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor... There's that word again, right? This is about your works. This is about what you're doing for Jesus, for his glory. Not about your soul. Your soul was redeemed at the cross. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be what? Accepted by him or of him. Verse 10, for we must, we. Who here knows Jesus Christ as Savior? This is written to you and to me. For we must all, all means all. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There it is, mark it down. There's the phrase. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. Whether what? According to that, whether he had done, whether it be good, gold, silver, precious stones, or whether it be bad, wood, hay, stubble knowing therefore look what he calls it next the terror of the lord paul in writing to timothy in first timothy chapter number two talks about the shame that so many of us will experience at the judgment seat of christ see those of us that live in the latest in church we live we really do and he Pastor Mike touched on it, if not this last week, a couple studies ago of how sheltered we are living in this country. We really are. We live in a bubble. And I really believe that bubble is about to burst. What it all means, I don't know. I do care because I care for those that I know and I love. But again, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. The issue and the challenge is how will we respond when that bubble does in fact burst? We just live in some interesting times. So let's go back to the book of Revelation, which is what this study is supposed to be about. <laughs> Instead, it turned into a judgment seat of Christ study. Uh, where are we? Verse number four? Or verse number three? Verse number three speaks of that new song. I love that, man. I, one of my favorite times of the week if not my favorite time of the week is at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings when we gather as a church to sing praises to him I absolutely love it and I don't know if you've noticed but there's some consistency or there's some connection between preaching God's word and the songs that are actually sung I'm not sure how he does it I think he's just a spirit-filled dude. Not just kidding. He sees the sermon title every Tuesday morning. So Pastor Mike knows where we're gonna preach that Sunday. So I just I just blew his bubble, burst his bubble. But anyway, that being said, that being said, you know what I love about this verse though? 
He's personal. He gets really personal with the 144,000. He says, this is your song, you guys. This is yours. And you know what is so special about this passage? Look at verse number three again. And they sung the 140,000 as it were a new song, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Isn't that cool? I can't tell you the po- about the power of praise, man. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. The power of song. Build your pray- playlist. Make it your playlist. I don't know what it is. One of my most favorite recent songs, Come Jesus Come. I listen to it probably four or five times a day. I listen to it to at least two or three times a day. You know what, man, it just... Talk about a song that really prepares my heart. The power of song, the power of music. Isn't it interesting that that's exactly what Lucifer's role was before the fall in Ezekiel 28? He led the praise. The Bible defines him and and, and, and what's the word I'm looking for? The Bible describes him, that's the word, describes him as a musical instrument, man. I mean, he was literally an instrument. When he breathed and we spoke, music came out and the Lord was praised and he was worshiped. And then one day he says, no mas. And he led a rebellion, a mutiny, where he took one third of the angelic hosts with him. And look what he's done to music today. Hmm. Look at music and where it's at today. Man, the Grammys, not that I know anything about the Grammys because I never really watched. To me, those award shows are nothing more but a bunch of vain people self-glorifying themselves. I hate award shows. I really do. I despise them. But I saw some YouTube thing the other day where the Grammys this past, when was it, like in February, whenever it was? Man, talk about satanic imagery, man. And some of the songs that they're singing and some of these, these artists, if, they are call, if you would call them artists, man, and what they're doing with music, right, to corrupt the minds of young people when God intended it and designed it for his glory, for him to be praised. And I don't know what your playlist looks like, but I would hope that there's some new songs on your playlist that are just yours I'll ask Larry every once in a while, hey, have you heard this song? And she goes, yeah, a couple months ago. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, he's bursting my bubble. Here I thought I turned her on to something really cool. <laughs> Look at verse four. The 144,000, again, being raptured, and they're in the presence of the Lord. Verse number four of the book of Revelation says this. And as it were, have not defiled themselves with women. This is what um, Al was just asking about. For they are what? Virgins, Virgins, plural. Huge difference between virgins singular and virgins plural. If you put an S on Ezra's chest, he's what? Superman. Superman. (laughs) Right? So here's the point, man. It matters. Context matters. Remember principle number five? The principle of measured words, the words and phrases of the Bible reveal to us its truths. And you need to draw a distinction between who the 144,000 are, virgins versus the virgin. And it's not Mary, although she was a virgin. (laughs) It's talking about the body of Christ, the church. I'm talking prophetically, right? Look at this, verse number four. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Isn't that awesome? Man, followers of Jesus to the nth degree. What a character quality be considered, huh? Wouldn't that be awesome if that could be said of us? They followed him wherever he goes. In other words, whatever Jesus said, they just did it. One of my favorite verses is... um, is Joshua chapter five, verse number 14. Remember that passage in chapter number five? Joshua is 
sitting there on the east side of the Jordan, probably on the side of a little hill or cliff looking across the Jordan. He's able to see Jericho and he's thinking to himself, man, how the heck are we going to take that city? And who just happens to show up? The Lord Jesus Christ, the captain of the Lord of hosts. Remember, how do we know it's Jesus? Because he fell down on his face. Actually, Jesus told him, take off your shoes because where you're standing is holy. He takes off his shoes, falls on his face and worships him. And then Joshua stands up and the very next thing that comes out of Joshua's mouth is really profound. You know what he asks? What saith my Lord unto his servant? Imagine if we asked that question every day. What would you have me today to do? What would you have me do today, Lord? Not your will, not my will, but thy will be done. Right? It's, it's simple. It's really that simple. But man, it's hard to live, isn't it? Isn't it? Why? You're in my stinking free will. So the more you are transformed into his image, the more you're able to follow him. These guys followed him, man. What an example they are to you and to me. <clears throat> Look with me real quick. Let's unpack this whole notion of the, um, the virgins thing. I want to take you back to Matthew chapter number 25. Um, just so you can see the passage that was referred to in that documentary that we all looked at together the other day. Um, and again, I don't know if it was J.D. Farag or Jack Hibbs. It was one of those two guys that were talking about the, the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25. And one of the things that you need to be mindful of, it's not, context is not the tribulation period, right? It's not. I need you to understand. I'm sorry, the context the context is not the rapture, it's the tribulation period, right? Although the whole Galilean thing that we were looking at had to do with the wedding. Remember the Galilean wedding? Larry, could you put up the Revelation chart up again, please? Look at when the marriage supper of the Lamb shows up. Where does it show up? Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Are you with me? So these guys are in heaven halfway through the tribulation period, somewhere around the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, they make their way up into the presence of God. So now they're experiencing and they're seeing exactly what Jesus is going to drive home here in Matthew chapter number 25. Because what I don't ever want you to lose sight of, right? Because it's easy to try to put the rapture inside of Matthew 24 like a lot of people do. Rapture is nowhere to be seen in Matthew 24. One of these days I'll share with you when it talks about those, those two women in the, in, the, in the mill, right? One was taken and one was left. I'm gonna show you where that one was taken. It's not heaven. It's really interesting. It's really fascinating. It's revealed to us in the Gospel of Luke 17, actually. But here's my point. People try to put the rapture inside these tribulation period passages like Matthew 24, Matthew 25. The rapture is something that is unique to you and to me. It's something that is revealed only to the church, right? One of the seven what? Mysteries. The rapture is one of the seven mysteries that God gave the body of Christ. Where is, that, where is the rapture of the church revealed to us as in mystery form in the, in the New Testament? Yeah, it's in Thessalonians, but I'm talking where it's explicit, where the word mystery is specifically or explicit, explicitly mentioned. First Corinthians what? 1558, right? And I show you a great mystery that you would, that what? You should all, I, you, that, you'll, that you'll all be changed. 1551, what did I say, 54? Are you with me? That's a revelation to and only the church. The church was revealed those seven things. Those are unique to us. We get seven of them. You know how many Israel gets? 12, the 12 mysteries, where are those mysteries revealed or where are they laid out for you and for me? In the gospels, in Matthew chapter number 12, the, gospel, the mysteries of the kingdom, right? Are you with me, right? So seven for the church, 12 for Israel. You have to draw those distinctions or you're gonna put the church in the trib, or you're, gonna put the, you're gonna put Israel somewhere else. 
And this is why you see a lot of replacement theology. Wait till we get to this whole kingdom thing over here. In chapter number 20, we're gonna talk about how many Christians believe that they've replaced Israel in God's plan. It's crazy where we find ourselves. So Matthew 25, let's look at verse one through 13 real quick. We'll unpack these. This is right after, are you with me? Chapter number 24 which is the Olivet Discourse and Jesus referring to all these end time signs. Remember that? Look at verse one. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, mark that phrase down, kingdom of heaven. Just like the movie with Orlando Bloom, you should watch that sometime. It's pretty good actually about the whole crusades thing. But the phrase kingdom of heaven only shows up. Are you ready for this? Only shows up in the gospel of Matthew, the kingdom gospel. What is God's kingdom referred to in the New Testament? 1 Corinthians 10, the kingdom of God. See, one's spiritual, one's literal. So he says this, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins, which took their lamps and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. that they were foolish, they took their lamps and took no oil with them. Verse number four says this, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried and they all slumbered and they slept. Remember that from the documentary? Some kept the lamps oil. And and typically, when do we need light? During the what? During the day? Yeah, I couldn't imagine what your light bill looks like. <laughs> You're like my wife. <laughs> Seven o'clock, 6.30, I'm gonna throw Larry under the bus right now. I'm turning lights off, closets, porches, you name it. And I, my meter's doing this. Anyway. <laughs> Does she do that to you at your house? Man, oh man. So... You want to hear something cool? You can buy these on Amazon. You want to hear something really cool? You can buy light bulbs that are, what are they called, Larry? Dawn to dusk. (laughs) Put them in your porch so they shut off during the day even though you leave the light switch on. That's for you ladies in the room. (laughs) That's for the Larry Romero's in the room. Yeah, see, she didn't come from a family of 10 where I had to turn the light switches off. We had to turn everything off, (laughs) including Steve's pacemaker. (laughs) Look at verse six. And why, and when do we need light? At nighttime, in the night. I don't know if you know this about the church age, but it's like into the night. Mark chapter number 13, the last passage refers to the four periods of the of the night of the evening for a jew when does the day begin at dusk right six o'clock six to six is the night time and what's really interesting the church age is like into the night time look at this and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him And all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready, they went in with him to the what? To the marriage. Are you getting the doctrinal picture here? What marriage are we talking about? The marriage supper of the Lamb just before his return. And the door was what? The door was shut. Remember that from that little that little documentary thing? The door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I send you. I know you not. Watch, therefore, for ye know 
neither the day nor the hour wherein the what? The Son of Man, which is a reference to the Messiah, Daniel chapter number seven, Jesus Christ. Are you seeing the picture here? So does that answer your question now about who these guys are? So that's who they are. Verse number five, book of Revelation. And their mouth, and in their mouth, no lie was found. For they are, I love this, for they are blameless. They went out and they preached the gospel. Thousands, millions came to Christ. And nobody could find any fault is why the devil the adversary despised them and hated them as much as he did. So let's look at the next point, how the messages are revealed. And this is pretty much the passage that I was referring to earlier um, as it relates to being a trailer for the rest of the book, for the rest of the chapters that deal with the tribulation period because you're getting a little synopsis, if you will, a little snapshot or a glimpse of what it's going to be like. And the first thing that he mentions is this everlasting gospel. Look here with me here in verse number six. Now these messages are revealed. There's gonna be three very distinct messages that are brought about by angels. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead and an an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and language and people, right? We already talked earlier about there's another gospel out there, another gospels, right? The social gospel, the prosperity gospel, all these other gospels that are proclaiming good news when in fact it's really bondage. But in this passage or in this verse, you see a reference to the everlasting gospel, Mark this down because this is the only occurrence of this phrase in all of the Bible right here in the book of Revelation. So it's not like you can take your concordance and run it through the Bible to see and get an explicit definition of what the everlasting gospel is. What is the everlasting good news is the idea here, the notion, right? We know that to the church, the gospel message is what? The death? burial and resurrection. That's the good news in the church age. In the tribulation period, and you see this in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 14, the message that those 144,000 are gonna be preaching is the fact that the Messiah is coming. It's referred to as the gospel of the kingdom. But what is the everlasting gospel? Think about the word everlasting. It's what? It's eternal. It's absolutely eternal. I'm going to just share with you some thoughts of what I believe is the everlasting gospel because you see an amazing pattern in how God works. Larry, could you throw up the dispensational chart, please? And this is on page number 12 in your little books, in your little handbooks. But if you look closely at the legend, right? There's a little box over down here to the left, right here. And this is page number 12 if you want to go ahead and follow along. But these little blue humps are what we would refer to as dispensations, right? The word dispensation being a biblical word, it's found twice in the New Testament, actually three times, twice in Ephesians and once in Colossians. And we refer to this dispensational perspective as simply being God's plan for the ages. Here's something that you need to be mindful and aware. Look with me back at Revelation chapter number Revelation number six. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. So there's your context. They're gonna be preaching this everlasting gospel to those that are on earth. Obviously the 144,000 of those followers of Jesus have left the planet, right? The rapture of of the tribulation period saints. Look at this. To every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his what? Of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now he's dealing with an earthly message, if you will. 
And this angel is proclaiming this everlasting gospel. And part of that gospel includes what? Judgment. Are you with me? Because here's what I want you to be mindful of. Although I'm a dispensationalist, if you will, in my belief, we can never be hyper in anything that we believe or teach. In other words, you can't get so extreme in either way. You have to be balanced in anything and everything that you do when approaching God's word, right? Proverbs 11, 1, a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So we know that there's a very explicit gospel for the church, 1 Corinthians 15, verses one through four. There's a gospel for Israel, the coming kingdom, right? But what is the everlasting gospel? I believe it's revealed to us in this chart. And you know what it is? Every one of these are called dispensations. And what's a dispensation? And I've given you kind of a crude definition in the past. A real simple concept, a real simplified definition for the word dispensation. Think about the root word in dispensation. Dispense Dispense what? Thank you, Florence. Did you read that somewhere on there? I'm impressed. There you go. It's in the notes. Good for you. You nailed it. Thanks for reading the notes. But anyway, here's my point. You know what God has done throughout history? Remember with the whole days of Noah over here? Genesis chapter 6, verse number 4, I think, maybe 8. I don't know, somewhere around there. The Bible says that what? Noah found grace in the eyes, in the sight of the Lord. You know what a dispensation is? Nothing more. God dispensing his grace throughout history. That's all it is, man. Just differently. And because of man's failure to be, to really own up to that responsibility or that stewardship of that dispensation, he always, or throughout history, has failed in his stewardship. And what's the effect of that? Judgment. Judgment. You know what the judgments are? These little black valleys over here. Look at Israel's. What's Israel's judgment? The tribulation period. What was Adam and Eve's? What's Adam and Eve's? Curse. Having to get up every day for all those years and go to work. Ezra, Bobby Lee. For you ladies, what? What's what's your curse? Childbirth pain? Are you with me? Look at the next one. Man, God dispenses his grace to Noah. Sons of God show up and they wreak havoc. All, everything goes to hell in a handbasket and God has to do what? Bring about judgment. With what? How did he bring judgment? The flood. What happened over here with the human government thing in Genesis chapter number 10, right? Over here, Genesis chapter 10 and 11, the Tower of Babel, what did he do? He dispersed the peoples and creates the languages. And I don't know what you guys believe about Pangea, but I do. Anybody know what Pangea is? Yeah. Continental uh, drift. Not only did these people end up in certain parts of the land, but the continents drifted apart so that He could separate them and the languages came about. And then all of a sudden, Genesis chapter 12 over here, Abraham shows up. And God gives him this amazing promise of purpose, being a blessing to the world, even a promised land. And then when you get to the end of the book of Genesis, when you get to chapter number 50 in the book of Genesis, where do do God's people find themselves? (laughs) Where? Where? in bondage in Egypt. (laughs) Go figure. Over what? Same thing as the book of Ruth, over famine. And that's where the story picks up. So they didn't stay true to the promise that God had made for him. So what's his judgment? Egyptian bondage. And then God brings in a liberator, a deliverer. We know him as Moses. Moses delivers the nation of Israel from 400 years of bondage. 
And they make themselves, they cross the Red Sea and they start making their way up to the promised land, the land of promise. And what begins to happen with the hearts and the lives of the people? They start to whine and complain and to murmur. And God has to do what? Give them a bunch of rules. It's called the law. It starts with the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. By the time you get to the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers, and then he has to give them the law a second time. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Why? Because they're stubborn, knuckleheaded people like you and I. And even after God does all this stuff and puts them in this land and allows them to establish a kingdom, which is always his intent, always his design, right? That is, after all, the theme of the Bible. What happens? They let the kingdom get away from them. They squander it. The kingdom is divided. Ten northern tribes, two southern tribes, they're at war with each other. I heard there's a movie out called Civil War. Hope to go see that pretty soon. What's that term that you always use, Marvin? Uh, um, predictive programming. I wonder what predictive programming is all about. Could they be conditioning you? Could they be? I'll tell you what, there's some forces at work that are dividing us like never before. Race, gender, politics, you name it. It's crazy where we find ourselves, man. It's nuts. It happened to God's people in the Old Testament? Don't think it can't happen to God's people in the New. Don't think. So what happens? Jesus shows up to redeem and to restore and to bring about his kingdom on earth, right? How do we know that? At his birth, the wise men show up and they're asking the question, where is he that is what? Born savior of the world? Is that the question that's asked? No, they're asking one question. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Even at the end of his life, Pilate had that sign hung over his cross that said king of the Jews. They crowned him with thorns to mock him. And God says, all right, you guys are gonna end up in diaspora. And I'm gonna start over in the book of Acts and create this amazing little entity called the body of Christ, the virgin. And here we are. You know where we are? Chronologically? Right here, just before this event happens. Right here. And guess what's gonna happen next? Judgment. Are you with me? All this, I believe, is the everlasting gospel. God dispensing his grace, man being foolish and stubborn and absurd, and God has to bring about judgment. And that's what you see happening in the rest of this book. That's what the whole wrath of God is about. When we start getting into chapter number 16, 17, and 18, man, the hammer's gonna come down hard. So look with me here in the, the rest of this passage. It's already 8.30, so we need to get through this. Verse number eight. Verse number eight. <clears throat> the first angel is warning of the hour of judgment, right? What's the judgment going to do? It's going to right every wrong. And I brought, I, I gleaned that phrase from the song, Come Jesus Come, where he's going to right every wrong. You know what else he's going to do? He's going to deal with evil once and for all. Man, it's an evil world. It's a sad, broken, dysfunctional, evil, sinful need of Christ's world and the world hates him, despises him. And that's who he's going to contend with in the rest of this book of Revelation study. Look at verse number eight. And another angel, second followed, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Man, I don't even know where to begin with that whole theme, right? But there's some spiritual fornication that you need to be aware of and bear with me because one of the things that Paul, you're getting a glimpse, right? This is a trailer, remember that? This is a trailer to what God's gonna do in Revelation chapters 17 and 18. 
He's going to deal with this whole mystery Babylon religion once and for all. Wait till we get there and we reveal who the whore, the mother of harlots really is. And she's been present since when? Genesis chapter number 11. Babel. Babel. You know what Babel means? God, a gate, uh, God, to God's gate or gates God. Bab means gate. El means God. God's gate. Man wanting to get to God under his own terms. And there's one system that advocates that like no other. And wait till we get to chapter number 17. Your mind will be blown because I'm going to take you through history from Genesis chapter 11 to where we're at today to reveal who this Babylonian mystery is, who she is, where she's at, and ultimately how God will contend and deal with her. So that's that second angel. This trailer, this message of the second angel was how he's going to deal with the harlot. Mystery Babylon the Great. And then verses 9 through 11, this third angel shows up. And it's a warning of those that will ultimately fall in line and follow and choose to follow the Antichrist. Remember that? We talked about that extensively in chapter number 13. Look with me in verses 9 through 11. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand. Does that ring a bell? Revelation, what, 13, 18. Remember that from our previous study? He also will drink the wine of God's wrath. This is not man's wrath. This is not man doing, bringing judgment upon man. This is God's judgment. This is God's wrath. God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will... Uh, be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. The reality of what? Eternal separation from God. Eternal damnation. We know it as hell, but when we get to Revelation chapter 20, we're going to reveal to you the exact location. I believe it's there. It's got to be on this planet somewhere. It's known as the what? Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11, the lake of fire. And I've used this little metaphor before, this little example or analogy, but think about those two facilities over on Highway 14, right? If you go, if you're heading south towards uh, Cerrillos, on the left side you have the, what? The county correction facility, and we know that is what? The jail, the county jail. And what's the county jail for? Some of you guys are experts on this, this whole stuff, so, right? <laughs> you know, you know the, the jail inside and out, no pun intended. What's the county jail for? It's a holding place, right? It's a holding place until you go what? Until you go before the judge. Isn't it interesting now because of COVID, they have these guys on monitors now. They use Zoom now and they have these guys in their jumpsuits at the jail. They don't even bring them out anymore. Remember, there used to be a whole bunch of them up here at the magistrate court. They just leave them there now and they just bring them, put them on cameras. And <laughs> now you're there so that everybody could see on TV. Which is good, man. Shame those dudes. That being said, it's a holding place until when? Until they go before the judge. You know what that judgment is? Not the judgment seat of Christ. That's ours. The judgment of the great white throne judgment. So once that guy goes before the judge and he's in there for first degree murder, typically, or a lot, not typically, but it, if that happens to a certain, um, what's the term? Um, inmate, yeah, that's a good word, an inmate. And he gets judged, he ends up where? Across the street. The Santa Fe pen. And that's more permanent, isn't it? That's the lake of fire. And it's real. So we're gonna get an unpack Revelation chapter 20 when we get there because 
hell's going to literally bubble up to the surface of the earth. How do we know it has to be the surface? Because God's going to be present. You know who else is going to be present? You. You and I will be present. We will witness firsthand people that we know, people that we love, people that we were too embarrassed, people that we were too fearful to share the gospel with that ended up lost and will stand before this judge and ultimately cast into the lake of fire. That's called the second death. In other words, their first death was when they died and they ended up in the holding place. That holding place is hell. Where's hell today? The center of the earth. Remember that? Remember that from our, I don't even remember, when, no, Revelation chapter number nine study. Literal place, physical place. All geologists say, we don't know what's in the center of the earth. We know it's hot, duh. We know there's molten stuff going on down there. Uh, you guys are really smart. Well, there's a void and a holding place. And you know what's going on there? Torment and ultimately eternal torment. Pain and suffering, so much so that that rich man in Luke chapter number 16 as he encountered uh, Lazarus and Lazarus is over here on this side of this great gulf fixed and it's known as Abraham's bosom or what is also known as paradise and the rich man is over here and they're having this talk and remember uh, the rich man failed to minister or to care or to be what he needed to be to this, this poor beggar, Lazarus. He says, Lazarus, man, you ended up in a good place. Please, please have somebody from Abraham's bosom go back up to the earth and tell my brothers that this place is real. I'm begging you, go tell them that this is a real place. That's reality. We'll spend probably two weeks unpacking that entire truth in Revelation chapter 20 because it's really the culmination. It's really the culmination of what people that don't know Christ are going to experience. So what kind of sense of urgency do we have? And then the last thing that happens in this chapter, in this passage here, verses 12 and 13. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them, right? This is a reference again, keep in mind context of the tribulation period saints. You're, you've already heard it in, the, in our teaching in the book of Ruth. There's three different phases to a harvest, right? I'm kind of setting the stage for the last principle. There's the what? The first fruits. There's the main harvest. And then there's the gleanings. The first fruits from a, old, from a saint perspective are the Old Testament saints. When were they raptured? At the resurrection. Remember that in Matthew 27? When Jesus and the veil was rent and the graves were open and all these bodies were observed and witnessed in Jerusalem. Guess who those people saw? Ruth and Boaz. Probably Naomi. No, I'm going to say Naomi. Because God restores her at the end of the book. All those Old Testament saints are resurrected at his first coming, the first fruits. When's the main part of the harvest? Or what's the harvest? these last 2,000 years, the church age, the church age saints. Did you know the Bible calls you a saint? Yeah, you're a Christian, but you are a saint. He refers to the disciples over and over some 80 sometimes in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and 
a few times in the book of Acts, but nowhere do you find the word disciple in Paul's letters. You know why? He replaces the word disciple. And don't get me wrong, we use the term disciple all the time because disciple simply means one who learns. We want you to learn with discipleship, right? But you know what he calls you and me explicitly? Saints. To the saints in Corinth. To the saints in Ephesus. What does the word saint mean? Sanctified. Set apart. God has a purpose for your and my life. And we'll only realize that we'll only discover his purpose if we stay true to who he is, to what he's about. God wants to use us for his glory. And that's all a saint is. It's not some statue over in Rome somewhere or at the cathedral downtown. You are, in God's eyes, from a biblical perspective, you are a saint. And then there's the third, the gleanings. Who are the gleanings? The tribulation period saints. Three phases to the harvest. That being said, that's a good segue to our last point. The return of the Messiah. And listen closely to the verbiage or some of the terms that are used in this passage. They're really fascinating. Look at verse number 14. This is one of those glimpses of the second coming of Christ. Larry, real quick, can you throw the Revelation chart up, please? Although we're going to spend a lot of time unpacking the event in Revelation 19, 11, God's giving you a glimpse periodically throughout the book of Revelation of his return, this passage being one of them. In other words, he gives you these little, these little uh, snippets or trailers, if you will. But the event itself, we're going to unpack in great detail when we get to chapter number 19. Okay? So, that being said, um, look with me in verse number 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head. And look what he has in his hand. A what? A sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven And he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for the grapes are what? Are ripe. The grapes of wrath. The battle hymn of the republic speaks of the second coming of Christ. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Remember we used to sing those in school? Isn't it pathetic that we can't even do that today? Do you remember singing that in school? I do. You know where they got that from? Right here. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and he gathered the grapes, the grape harvest of the earth and he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the wine press, and you'll see this again in Revelation 19, as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia or 200 miles. 200 miles of sheer blood and guts because one of the things that I'm going to real share with you when we get to Revelation chapter number 19 that what has come to be known as the Battle of Armageddon is not a single battle, but a series of battles. It's a series of campaigns. And it's going to start down in the Sinai, near Egypt, and it's going to end in Jerusalem. In fact, you'll get little glimpses of that as we unpack a few more verses here. But turn with me real quick to, and I just want to share with you the, the how and where this reaping will occur. Look with me, first of all, in Matthew chapter number 13. I want to share with you this whole idea of the, the wheat and the tares. Remember that passage, that parable that Jesus speaks of? Matthew chapter number 13. 
Look with me here in verse number um, 24. Let's pick up there. Another parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, Jesus speaking to the disciples, saying, the kingdom of heaven, right? His literal kingdom on this earth. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while, the, but while men slept, hmm, the church age, right? What did Paul say about um, who's the God of this world? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, that's right, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Who's the God of this world? The devil, Satan, watch this. But while the men slept, church age, nighttime, his enemy came and he sowed tares among the wheat and then and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and they said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? You know what was really cool when we were in Israel because I knew nothing about the wheat and the tares till we visited Israel. And it was really cool, Larry, remember this when... Jim Martin, we were driving down, I uh, forget what part of Israel, but it was kind of in the middle part of the country. And he pulled over. He had the bus pull over and we could see up on this hillside. I don't know, anybody else on this trip with us? I think it was mine and Larry's first trip. It might've been. There were a bunch of Palestinians that were gleaning their wheat. And it was really cool because he had us get out of the bus. He says, let's go help them. Unbeknownst to Jim, to us, to like Jim Martin in particular, he wants to teach us a lesson, right? And sure enough, as we were down there and we started kind of helping these Palestinian women, women kind of glean some of this, and they were doing it by hand. A couple of them had these hand sickles um, and they were cutting the wheat and there was this one section and they said, don't go over there because that's where the tares were. And you know how you were able to identify the tares? Because they looked exactly like the wheat. They stood up vertically. They had no fruit. Because when the wheat stock, we were talking about the sheaves in the book of Ruth. If you notice when she's holding that sheaf, that wheat is leaning over, right? Because it's bearing fruit. And just like God's creation when it realizes who he is and it's creating fruit, man, it'll bow down to him. Well, the tares never bow because they have no fruit. And they told us, don't pick the tares. It was really cool because we were able to literally see the wheat and the tares. The tares look just like the wheat. See, there are a lot of Christians or there are a lot of people in church that think they're Christians, but they're not. Look at this. What verse am I on? 28. And he said unto them, and he said unto them, an enemy had done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, nay, lest while we gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the what? Until the harvest. The harvest is coming. The rapture of the church. And the wheat is going to be removed and the tares are going to be left behind. Look at this. But he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, nay, lest while we gather up the tares, you, you root also the wheat with them. Let them grow up together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into the what? The barn. The safe place. Question or comment? Yes. Yes? But how does it, when it says here, um, gather together first the tears, but rather Yes. Okay, so let's keep in mind the whole context, right? Book of Revelation. Rapture has happened. 
way back in Revelation chapter four. So now you have the gleanings, the tribulation period. This is at the end of the harvest, right? Just like in the book of Ruth, remember? The gleanings were all that was left over. What's left over? The, tri the tribulation period saints. Now jump over to verses 36 to 43 because Jesus unpacks this even further. Look with me at verse number 36. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and he went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Right, he's gonna expound on what all this means now like he always does. He answered and he said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. So who's the sower? The Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 38. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, second coming. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered together and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out his kingdom, all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth and shall the righteous, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Are you with me? We just talked about the lake of fire, huh? Seeing the pictures all the things that Jesus continues to communicate. So this was all about yes. Yes. This is all tribulation. This is all tribulation period stuff, right? Well, I mean, there's principles, right? That apply. Yeah. So that's the how. That's how he's going to do it. And I'm not going to, let me just give you some verses. I think they're in your notes. This is how the battle of Armageddon is gonna play out. Um, in Isaiah chapter 63, verses one through six, you're gonna see Christ make every, every wrong right. In Joel chapter three, he's gonna gather the nations. In Nahum one, one through six, you're gonna see a demonstration of his power at his second coming. And as you'll see when we get there in Revelation 19, we're gonna look at the actual event and the details of the event. Now, where's all this gonna happen? Let me just throw this this slide up, Larry, with the, the pictures in it. This is known as the Jezreel Valley in um, northern part of Israel, just west of the Sea of Galilee. This valley right here is the Sea of Galilee. There's a couple of key mountains that are awesome milestones. Mount Tabor over here, Mount Moriah over here, and then Mount Carmel. What's really cool, you guys know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up where? In Nazareth. There's a little area here that I absolutely love visiting. It's known as the Nazareth Ridge. Nazareth sits up on a hill kind of overlooking the Jezreel Valley, which is right here. And every time we've been to Israel, Jim Martin takes us there so that we can look over the entire valley. And it's really cool because sometimes I just kind of sit there and ponder and think to myself, man, can you imagine Jesus sitting here and observing all this stuff when he was a child at 12 years old and realizing that someday he's going to return in that very spot to avenge and to do everything that we just read. Because here's what's really interesting about this valley. More blood has been shed in this valley than anywhere else on the planet. When Napoleon made his, made his way up from Egypt all the way up the coast, when you come over here, you can't see it on this map, but right here is Haifa. And then there's a hill that you have to climb up. Once you get down into Mount Carmel, this is where Elijah was at war with the prophets of Baal. And another little village just out of there, you can't see it, but it is, that's where Megiddo is, Armageddon. By the way, the word Armageddon means, um, um, it's on your notes, the place of slaughter is what it means. When Napoleon, mind you, in the 19th, in the 19th century, I'm talking about 1890, when he made his way up over here to Megiddo and he looked across the Jezreel Valley, he says, man, what a perfect place for a battle. Those are his exact words. And more blood has been shed. In fact, over and over, you see battles that are playing out in the Jezreel Valley. I've listed a, a bunch of them right here for you where Barak defeats the Canaanites and Judges. 
the infamous battle where Gideon defeats the Midianites. As a matter of fact, over here, just to the southwest of, of um, the Jezreel Valley, where this little river is, is where um, Joshua had his 300, is it 300, Mike? How many men? That he had drink water from the brook. Remember that? And those that lapped up the water, he says, sorry, can't use you. And the ones that, or was it the other way around? However it goes. But it was really cool because we were at that stream and I got down like a dog lapping in the water and Larry took a picture. <laughs> but it was really cool. That's the stream where you see this whole story of Gideon. And Gideon's 300 actually. And then defeated the entire Midianite Christ. It's just down the, on the east side of the valley where Saul is killed by the Philistines. Um, on Mount Gibeon, uh, Mount Gilboa. Um, Azahiah is killed by Ahuz. Josiah is slain by the Egyptian army in 2 Kings 3. Over and over. Jesus, as he makes his way up, and we're going to talk about this in great detail, as he's making his way up into the Jezreel Valley, is going to confront all these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of armed forces. Some of the, arm, some of the forces that are going to be present are listed here in your notes the Ten Kingdom Alliance of the Antichrist, the kings of the north, the kings of the east, China, the kings of the south, they're all gonna meet here and this is where they're all gonna be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ and his army. And then he'll make his way down into Jerusalem and we'll talk about the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Just a couple things, this is Mount Tabor. This picture was taken by my wife, by Larry. This is stan us standing on the Nazareth Ridge. This is a little Palestinian village down here. And this is the, the, the east side of the valley. This is the west side of the valley looking from, um, looking from Mount Carmel. So all this is the Jezreel Valley. This is Megiddo. This is where the Battle of Armageddon gets its name from the Valley of Megiddo. Here's what's really interesting. Does, anything, does, that, does that look familiar to anybody? You know what that is? It's an Air Force base. And what's really fascinating, this is where the Israelis are flying missions into Lebanon and it is Syria today. So when they took out that embassy last week, that consulate that killed those six Iranian, one of the this number two command general, flew right out of this air base up in northern Israel. Syria's up in here in what is known as the Golan. Lebanon is up here, Right? There's kind of a glimpse. This is Lebanon and this is Syria. Here's what's interesting. Here's what's fascinating. We had the privilege of being in the Golan Heights looking down into the Damascus Valley. Remember that, Sylvia? As we were looking down and there was a, a big um, IDF army post behind us and down below is, was a Canadian United Nations military base. Are you ready for this? The Russians just took over that military base. They're right on the border of the Golan Heights right now. A stone's throw from here to Sonic away. Is that a stone's throw? That close is where the Russians are to the border of Northern Israel today. I could still see that Canadian base. Well, the Russians just took it over two weeks ago. Canadians went home with their tail between their legs. Did I see a hand? Yes? Have they ever been to a place before? The Russians? Um, I'll tell you what. Um, you guys know who Alexander Dugan is? He's the philosopher that has Putin's ear. He's the one that has kind of indoctrinated him to become this Eastern Orthodox religious zealot. <laughs> Just two days ago, he's pushing Putin to go into Jerusalem. So what word are we talking about right now? Ezekiel 38. I'm telling you folks, everything is lining up beautifully. We need to get our heads out of the sand. We need to keep our heads on the swill. We need to stay in his word, love one another, care for one another, focus on the wood, no, not the wood, hey, stubble, the gold, silver, precious stones, and let God be God. Let him use us for his glory. So they have never been that close, but they're there. What's fascinating, if you go to Jerusalem and if you go to um, the east part of the Temple Mount, you know, on the Temple Mount as you're looking into the Kidron Valley, just behind the Church of the Nations is this big, massive Russian Orthodox cathedral. And um, 
Not too many of us went up there because it's right on the Mount of Olives. You remember that, Dennis? Um, a lot of us took a hike up. It's really interesting is they are advocating heavily the whole Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, um, Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia's bring the kingdom back. And that's where they're at. That's what they're advocating. And what's really interesting, while the West is caught up on all this depravity and perversion, sexual orientation stuff, and that's all coming out of America, the Russians are embracing this staunch religious family orthodox. So a lot of people are buying into, don't get me wrong, man, that's just as big a lie because it's still religion. There's only one faith that matters, and that is a biblical faith, a biblical view. So on one side, the West is all perverted. On the other side, the Russians are embracing their orthodoxy and their religion. And they're becoming pretty self-righteous and self-pious over that whole thing. It's a crazy world. Who would have thought? Would have thought I could have. Who would have thought that all these atheist communists that made up the former Soviet Union, that made up Soviet Russia, Putin being one of them, he was a devout, staunch communist when he was stationed in East Germany is now this religious Eastern Orthodox Russian zealot. Nation shall war against nation, right? You can't separate ethnicity from religion. How many of us that have Spanish surnames, you think you were given a choice of what religion you were to follow? No, you weren't. You didn't. Why? Because of Spain. But the Lord Jesus Christ, because of that cross, liberated you and me from religion. All glory to him. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for our time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this amazing chapter, Lord Jesus. And I pray that as a church, we would embrace and be mindful of the day and age and the times and the seasons. And Lord, just look forward to your return. Let us, Lord Jesus, as we considered all last year, continue to prepare for the blessed hope. We look forward to the day, Lord Jesus, where we hear the phrase, come up hither, just like Boaz called Ruth, Lord, into his home. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and Lord, we give you all the glory this evening in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.